Hi everyone, my name is Venetia Baker and I work for LSHTM. Today I'm going to discuss how my colleague Azolda Bird Thistle and I pivoted our research evaluation of a mass media campaign to remote methods in response to COVID. So specifically I'm going to talk about how we use social media to conduct a real-time evaluation on MTV Sugar. MTV Sugar is a mass media campaign that centers around a TV drama. The drama aims to help young people make informed choices about their health using entertaining storylines. The campaign also includes social media platforms where viewers can engage with content. In response to the pandemic, MTV Sugar developed a remotely filmed COVID series called Alone Together. Episodes were uploaded to YouTube in daily five minute installments and they featured characters virtually interacting with each other while they explained how the pandemic had impacted their lives. So we pivoted our MTV Sugar evaluation to focus on the new COVID series. And our aim was to understand how the series impacted and influenced viewers' knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors around COVID. But additionally, we wanted to examine how viewers engaged with the show through social media. We analyzed the data using an inductive thematic approach. Uh, we wanted to capture young people's reactions in real time as the response and knowledge around the pandemic was changing rapidly. So we, we analyzed the data within a week of each episode premiering. Our analysis was a component of a collaboration between LSHTM and MTV to disseminate timely and accurate information about COVID to young people. So we met weekly to report our social media findings and future scripts and storylines were then modified to incorporate the emerging insights. In total, the series had over 900,000 views over 70 episodes with an average of 5,600 unique viewers per episode. And viewers comments ranged from 26 to 164 per episode. In our findings, we discovered that there were components of the show that generated significant audience engagement. This included love stories, suspense, and comedic scenes. These elements were important entertainment hooks that kept the viewers engaged. We discovered the scenes that evoked an emotional response resonated most with viewers. Emotional investment was an important mechanism that made viewers receptive to Sugar's educational uh, messages. Um, comments demonstrated that watching the show made viewers more empathetic as they became more aware of the experience of others. As a result, viewers encouraged their online peers to be more community-minded and to take COVID more seriously. Dialogue between viewers created an opportunity for learning. Viewers shared with their peers and challenged each, shared information with their peers and challenged each other's points of view. MTV Sugar's production team also responded to viewers on the platform. Um, those that shared poignant messages or addressed messages that conflicted with their aims. And viewers used social media as an online space where they formed a sugar community. Here they bonded over their interest in sugars, um, shared their personal experiences, offered support and advice to each other and more. The sugar community was particularly valued during COVID as many viewers faced challenging times or were isolated. Viewers also use social media to feedback what they liked and didn't like about the show to MTV Sugar. And MTV Sugar could respond to individuals to acknowledge that they had received that feedback. A central aim of MTV Sugar is to link young people to relevant resources. And we saw an asset of online and the comment section was that viewers could directly connect with the MTV Sugar team to receive links to resources that fit their individual need. 
Social media generates participant guided data. Users can choose if and how they engage in topics. So this produces candid responses and it can reduce participant and research bias that can arise from a more traditional interview setting. However, as participation is voluntary, a sample bias towards those who are most engaged with the show is likely. Social media is also a valuable evaluation tool as it allows for quick analysis in real time. The digital nature of the data is partic particularly useful in an era of COVID where remote methods are necessary. And as all of the data is public, it can be captured without ethic ethics approval. We actually did you chose to use this data while we were waiting for ethic approval from other parts of our evaluation, which had to be amended due to COVID. Young people are often mischaracterized in research as hard to reach. Um, however, this data shows that young people are accessible and willing to share their perceptions and experiences. And we need to show up to the spaces in which they occupy and those spaces are online. So I just want to people. From yes, it's a scary reality. And yes, people are getting sick and some even dying. But we can all do our best to curb the spread. COVID can be beaten. If we just make the effort to do better, all of us. At the end of the day, we're all in this together. Every single one of us. And even though these lockdown times can make us all feel pretty alone, we can do this alone together. Thank you. Thank you, Venetia, for a fantastic and engaging presentation. Now we have our next presenter, Sadvi Kalra from Care USA presenting on measuring the impact of COVID-19 on social norms and child early and forced marriage. Lessons learned from an RCT evaluation of the Tipping Point Initiative. Hi, thank okay. you. Hi, I think it's gonna start straight away, so I'll just say, ready, go. Is that okay with you? Okay. Ready, go. Yes. Thank you so much, everyone. My name is Sadvi Kaldra. I am the Monitoring Evaluation and Learning Specialist for the Tipping Point Project. And um, today I will be talking about the lessons that we have learned from an RCT evaluation of Tipping Point Initiative, which focuses on child early and forced marriages in Bangladesh as well as uh, in Nepal. Tipping Point Project, to give you a little bit of an introduction, focuses on addressing the root causes of child early and forced marriage, promoting the rights of adolescent girls through community level programming and evidence generation in Nepal and Bangladesh, and multi-level advocacy and cross-learning efforts across the globe. Some of the immediate steps that the Tipping Point Project through care that has, they, they have taken on the ground for COVID relief measures is to support communities in COVID relief distribution, in our intervention, as well as in our control communities. Also, we have been, you know, virtually been in touch with tipping point participants, and we have told them COVID related risk messages. We have also done some amount of work with girls, boys, mothers, and fathers um, since implementation suspended in March, 2020, when COVID started, but a selected few have begun with all the precautions in place. Uh, we have um, shifted our ways of intervention on the ground. This involves assessment, you know, uh, to, to we have shifted our way to a virtual mode of intervention, which included assessment of the community members' access to phone and internet. It also involved taking consent and assent from adolescents and parents. Uh, the problem with, uh, with our uh, work has been that Tipping Point is used actually doing a cluster uh, randomized control trial. And there have been challenges posed by COVID-19 on measuring the impact of this, this intervention spe specifically for 
our RCT evaluation. The good uh, thing is that the baseline data collection was already over, but there are still impacts of COVID. For example, increased risk of harmful work because of financial impact, which we feel is a major impact of COVID-19, which will then have an impact on the CEFM rates and the root causes in the community. There are some other impacts that we are seeing might happen are increased caregiving burdens among women, increased exposure to gender-based violence, reduced protection services for women and girls. We are also thinking that there is a possibility that there will be disrupted education, there will be disrupted sexual reproductive and health rights. Uh, and services, um, and also the healthcare services in general, although Tipping Point has its own activities of creating, for example, sanitary pads, etc., on the ground, but those activities have suspended in themselves, so that becomes a barrier as well. There is also an impact that we are uh, expecting will happen in the mobility of girls, which will then cause education to being halted and also that would then eventually could lead to risk of early marriage and forced marriage in a lot of situations. Now what happens is that these uh, challenges in measuring impact, especially specifically in the context of a cluster RCT, some of the challenges that we see is the diffusion of tipping points impact due to suspension of implementation. And we are also recognizing an increased risk of migration on the ground because of the economic impact of the pandemic. We are also thinking that there will be an impact on our comparability of intervention uh, communities. We have two intervention arms and they are differ deferred by social norm public events. And if one of if the social norm public events, which are a big, which attract a big crowd cannot be done, that creates a problem for comparability of the arms. To deal with some of these issues, and luckily because the baseline was already over, we decided to pivot our monitoring activities, which involves activity tracking, some outcome tracking, implementation fidelity activities, as well as feedback mechanisms to um, identify and to work on the impact of COVID-19. One of the first things we are doing is doing basic activity tracking of our virtual sessions through a data aggregated software, which is called Kobo Toolbox, which the field facilitators can use on the ground to aggregate basic data on participation as well as attendance rates. Other than that, uh, we are also doing tracking uh, on our key outcomes using longitudinal interviews, or we call them uh, rolling profiles. Some of the things that we assess in these rolling profiles is the impact of COVID on communication between families, attitudes regarding gender roles and expectations, and communication regarding pu puberty and menstruation. We also are doing FGD with parents. That is happening after the lockdown is uh, lifted to assess the impact of COVID on gender roles and expectations from adolescent girls and boys, and understanding of adolescent girls' mobility and attitudes towards girls doing collective action. Another activity that we are doing is FGDs with our girl activists, which is girl activists is a key cohort of the Tipping Point team. We are doing these to understand the restrictions that are imposed since COVID in planning and conducting events by the girls, which the girls were doing before. And we are trying to also understand any changes in priority of girls to organize events. We also have implementation fidelity systems like sessions, observations and feedback from participants to understand the impact of this new mobility, also to understand the impacts the, that COVID has on key tipping point indicators. We also have active review and reflection and learning in a virtual modality with our staff members to reflect on how we can provide different interventions in a different modality to our participants. Also reflections from the staff on the stress imposed on them due to COVID-19. Uh, you can find the resources or the tools, etc., from Tipping Point's work on the monitoring tools, as well as the detailed RCT evaluation design and what how we have worked towards it on our website. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Safi, for a very uh, interesting presentation with lots of wonderful ideas about monitoring and evaluation. Next, we have Michelle Decker from Johns Hopkins University. 
Uh, Michelle will be presenting on remote data collection for GBV and other gender dynamics of COVID-19 among youth in Nairobi, Kenya, methods, ethics, and preliminary results. Ready, Michelle? Great, thank you so much. I'm thrilled to have a chance to share some of our work here um, in Nairobi and our sort of our pivot to remote data collection and some of the ways that we needed to um, build an innovation in the ethics pieces as well as the mechanics. And I'll share a couple of preliminary results as well. This is my first Pecha Kucha, so I hope the timing works out. <laughs> Thank you so much for, um, for having me. So this is, um, we about a year ago, we had run a respondent-driven sampling survey with unmarried youth in Nairobi. It was primarily focused on family planning as well as gender-based power imbalances. So when the needs came up around understanding the impact on COVID, uh, we felt this was a really useful platform because it was an existing sample. So we sought to do um, a mixed method study. Uh, we did phone-based surveys, which I'll primarily present on. We're also running a mini, mini survey, a message-based survey, and a series of remote uh, qualitative activities, focus group discussions for, uh, with youth and stakeholders, key informant interviews, um, and in-depth interviews. So we built in, you know, of course, all of our standard GBV ethics protections, the training protocol um, in concert with the international best practices, uh, obviously, the specialized training for this team on validating non-judgmental approaches to GBV topics, um, including sexual exploitation, um, and of course, that discrete referral to support services. Some of the things that we had to build in for the phone-based um, were around auditory privacy screeners. Uh, we introduced, we did that at the beginning, we built in a code word for potential privacy interruptions. Uh, we knew there was a risk for phone sharing um, that we had to address, and we also broke the survey up into two distinct sessions to minimize burden. For our qualitative components, um, we built in a number of Zoom protections, password protection, uh, locked room, voluntary video. Um, this sounds standard for the professional space, but we had to do a lot of logistics with our youth in preparation for these um, elements of the data collection. Just a couple of implementation parameters. We actually just finished this last week. Um, we have about 1,290 participants for a 95% response rate, which we thought was really incredible just about a year up. And we picked up, the privacy screener um, was effective. We picked up about 17 um, survey interviews where there was a risk for privacy violation and we needed to reschedule those. Um, as this audience is well familiar, um, we, the safety issues for young men in our sample primarily centered around police violence and interference. And then for, for young women, it was GBV and the sort of the added element of the COVID restrictions um, creating risk uh, for uh, elevated violence. Interestingly, in this sample, uh, the public safety was the issue primarily for young men and young women. About 14% of young women had experienced partner violence in the last year, and you won't be surprised to know that only about a third had IPV starting since the beginning of those restrictions. So this is really endemic to, this, to the environment, as it is so many places. We saw that only about a third of young women had actually received information about violence support services since COVID, um, which is a really actionable problem. And you see that for sexual harassment, um, there was it was endemic, although there was an increase for about a third of women, there was an increase in intensity. Um, in terms of the time, we were very interested in time and mobility constraints. So obviously government restrictions on movement, concerns for COVID exposure were the primary mobility restrictions. But young men faced, again, that fear of police harassment. And for young women, it was household disapproval and household related barriers. Very interesting for this population, the COVID restrictions for about a third increased their time with their dating partners, but it actually decreased their time with their dating partners for about 46%. This was not differential by gender. Um, and I hope you can see this quote, you're sort of seeing um, how the restrictions on movement can suppress these relationships. Obviously, um, I think we're all very familiar around the income dynamics uh, that we're facing due to the COVID loss of, loss of household income, both for women and for men, um, and a movement into that informal labor. There's already a lot of informal labor participation in this population. 
you see a couple of gender differences here um, in terms of young men, much more likely to be the primary income generator. Um, but both men and women are supporting others um, in terms of their basic needs, whether it's their children, family members within or outside the home. Um, so there's a real constraint on economic uh, economics in this setting. And then when we come to transactional partners, we see endemic in this setting, basic need meeting, obviously through transactional partnerships. And then COVID, the constraints of COVID on top of that um, are making these situations even more entrenched and increasing the dependence on those relationships. So here you see that quantified about a third of our young women were reporting past year transactional partners, but the majority had experienced that both prior to and during COVID. What changed was the dependence on that exchange. So that really increased for almost half of our women. And then just thinking about SRH, um, there's a deep concern endemic prior to COVID for unintended and early pregnancy in this environment. Um, and you see that echoed here. And then the fear of COVID exposure um, was actually one of the main barriers to accessing contraceptive supports. Um, even there were the, the hospitals were accessible, but there were concerns about exposure. And then I just kind of wanted to give you a snapshot on some of the differences in risk perceptions and behaviors. Um, these were very modest in terms of gender differences. They generally favored women in risk perception and in protective behavior, but not by a lot. Um, so our young men are also very actively engaged in prevention. So just a couple of, uh, as we move through analysis, um, we definitely saw, again, that situa situational risk of COVID exacerbating underlying epidemics. Um, and we found that this remote data collection was feasible um, and acceptable in the setting, provided that those logistics and those training pieces were in place to really support our team in making this pivot. Obviously, this is part of a huge team. Um, I'm thrilled to lead this um, in concert with PMA and ICRHK, um, as well as Kenyatta University Center for Gender Equity and Empowerment. So thank you very much. I see a couple of questions in the chat, so I'll, I'll circle back on there as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. And I will ask you to please, um, given that we are having these presentations that are very fast, maybe if you can reach out individually to the other to answer questions, that would be great. That was fantastic and really, really interesting in terms of the impact of COVID and how to conduct remote data collection. Thank you. Next, we have a Tia Palermo from Buffalo University and Lisagio Cajula from UNICEF and they will be presenting on real-time monitoring of COVID-19 impacts among adolescents and young people, their families and communities in the Southern Highlands regions in Tanzania. Okay, I will, are you ready to go? Yes, we are. Okay, here we go. Thank you. Uh, I present to you with my colleague Tia our experience in con uh, conducting monitoring of uh, impacts among adolescents and young people in Tanzania. And the effects of the pandemic so far globally up to last night, more than 37 million cases and more than 1 million deaths globally with economic consequences uh, due to social distancing, reduced demand for exports, dramatic reduction in tourism as uh, many countries as well. There are also have effects on gender, including uh, infection risk for women, also reproductive health risks and maternal mortality, early pregnancy and early marriage, especially for adolescent girls, uh, increased care burden for women, uh, women are also more likely to be laid off. Uh, the study was mobile, um, leveraging on an ongoing longitudinal study in Tanzania, which has been happening for almost uh, four years. And data collection included household health facilities communities. It started in September and will end in December. Our team is multidisciplinary from different organizations, including University at Buffalo, EDI Group, TASAF, TACADES, UNICEF Tanzania, as well as UNICEF Office of Research, where I work. And the study areas are two regions in the Southern Highlands, as earlier introduced. 
each with uh, two districts, Rungwe Busokelo in Beya and Mufindi and Mafinga in Iringa region. And the research questions included uh, how the pandemic is affecting livelihood and health access, uh, the coping strategies employed by youth and, fa and families, the gendered impact of COVID-19, as well as the barriers to health service utilization, both in demand and uh, supply side. The innovation includes uh, real-time impacts, um, also broad range of well-being indicators, including health and economic, uh, triangulating data uh, sources, using mixed messages, methods, as well as reaching a hard to reach population. There are several ethical considerations when you conduct a mobile data collection, including difficult to obtain parental consent, especially for minors over the phone. So we employed using safe uh, word for privacy, and then uh, we included a violence module, but we are not asking about sexual violence to, due to increased sensitivity. Other considerations include uh, using validated previously used modules, uh, shortened time um, incentives, uh, giving airtime to participants, uh, national phone registration. Unfortunately, in Tanzania, many phones were disconnected and also elections are happening in the next few weeks. We are using multiple study instruments, including quantitative and qualitative interviews with youth, qualitative interviews with communities, and SMS messaging every three weeks with households, youth, and health facilities. We're examining well being across various domains, including health, economic, and schooling domains, using a subset of survey items previously implemented over the past three years in this longitudinal cohort with face-to-face -face interviews previously. We're examining food and water insecurity using selected items from the household food insecurity and access scale, as well as the newly developed household water insecurity experiences scale or WISE. We collect information on participation in livelihoods activities over the past seven days and time use in the past 24 hours, and whether these have changed in the past six months due to impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. We also collect information on coping strategies employed to deal with economic challenges. We collect information on knowledge of COVID-19 symptoms, prevention practices, and sources of information, as well as whether the participant or a household member were sick in the previous month. Finally, we collect a subset of the CESD scale for depressive symptoms. Among those reporting having been sick, we ask whether they sought care and where. Then we ask if there's been any time in the past month when they wanted to seek health care for any reason but did not and why they did not seek care. Reasons may include distance, financial reasons, or crowding and long waits. We ask one of the transactional sex-related questions asked in the ongoing study, namely, in the past 12 months, did you start a sexual relationship with someone in order to get things that you needed, such as money or gifts? Finally, we ask a subset of the violence questions from the larger study. These include emotional violence, having been belittled, called names or humiliated, and physical violence, having been slapped, pushed, hit with a fist, kicked, or beaten up. Based on the overall study design, this is asked on a split sample for ethics reasons. So what's next? We're currently starting to analyze data between October and December. We're going to have briefs and a report written up between now and February, and we expect to further disseminate the findings in 2021 and continue in-depth analysis for publication through 2022. We are also hoping to resume um, in-person data collection in 2021 for the official wave four of this longitudinal study. Asantani. Thank you very much, Tia and Eustadio, for a great presentation with lots of tips. Um, 
can I ask you please to, if, um, if you want to ask direct questions, could you do it privately in the chat? Because because of the format, we want everybody <coughs> to sort of pay attention to their presenters. So if you do individually, then um, it'll be easier for everybody. Thank you very much. So next we have uh, Pinky Malangu presenting on uh, from South African Medical Research Council. And she will be presenting on exploring the links and impact of COVID-19 and lockdown to gender-based violence, mental health and livelihoods among selected population groups in South Africa. Thank you, Pinky. Thanks, Anna. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll be presenting on our research, um, exploring the impact. Next slide, please. Exploring the links and impact of COVID-19 and the lockdown to gender-based violence, mental health and livelihoods among selected population. And just to acknowledge colleagues in the Gender and Health Research Unit, um, including uh, Dr. Andrew Gibbs, who's also on this call today. So the study was funded by the SAMRC and the National uh, Research Foundation of the South Africa, uh, in South Africa. It aims uh, to understand the impact of COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdown on family dynamics among selected population groups. We particularly focus our study in Gauteng, which is one province in South Africa. So we interviewed men and women, 18 years and older, living with spouses or a partner and or with children. And component two of the study focused amongst frontline healthcare workers who are providing care during COVID-19 pandemic. And as I've said, it was uh, specifically um, focused on Gauteng province. We had two research objectives, first for men and women and the other objective for frontline healthcare workers. Amongst men and women 18 years and older, uh, we wanted to understand how COVID-19 and the lockdown has impacted on, family, on families of these women. And we were interested to see differences between uh, different income groups, those who had high income and those with um, low income. Amongst frontline healthcare workers, we just wanted to understand how working during this time impacted their lives and their families. We're interested in experiences of violence against women and children and the underlying factors influencing this. And really what we know is associated with IPV, including mental health and livelihoods. In terms of recruitment of our participants, uh, we recruited uh, through the SAMRC um, social media platforms where the advert was pasted on Twitter, uh, on Facebook, um, 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 we also shared it using WhatsApps. Um, and after uh, this, we, uh, as research, uh, uh, researchers, we copied this advert and pasted it on our personal Facebook pages and also asked other ex field workers in the unit to assist us in sharing the advert widely with their contacts. Participants then, uh, after seeing the advert, those who were interested sent us WhatsApp messages or they sent us text. We had a designated number where they could send this. Uh, some, those who had uh, access to email, they also emailed us to indicate their interest. We then conducted the first call where we contacted them and screened them for eligibility and then took them through the informed consent process where, it, where we emphasize privacy and confidentiality. And during the screening, we asked them if they'll have a private space where they'll be able to take the call and um, where there'll be nobody who will be disturbed disturbing them. And those who said that they would have this were then included in the study. So data was collected using semi-structured uh, telephone interviews, which lasted between 35 to 60 minutes. And as I've indicated, privacy and confidentiality was emphasized both during screening and when we started the interview. We needed to make sure that they'll be able to have private space. Um, in terms of our interviews, we match the interviews by gender and the language of the participant, uh, making sure that males are interviewed by a male researcher, uh, so are females. Participants were then electronically reimbursed 100 rand for their participation to thank them for the time. So what are some of the experiences that we learned during uh, these remote data collection um, methods that we employed? Um, we learned that um, rapport was difficult to establish uh, during this time over the phone. Uh, people were, though 
we found that Facebook and, and WhatsApp was actually a good platform for them to recruit, not only young people, but even older people. But when we started the interview, it was really difficult to conduct these interviews without any visual cues with the lines cutting and the network cutting. We had to call them again. So all those challenges we did experience. Some of the people wanted to do the interview quickly over the phone compared to when you have them face to face. We also learned that it was difficult to ensure privacy, though we emphasize this, but we could even overhear a third person uh, present in the room while we were conducting interview. And when we asked the participants, they just wanted to continue um, with the interview. What we also learned um, was um, around asking questions related to violence. While people were happy to talk about all the other questions livelihoods questions, mental health questions, uh, they were, most of them were reluctant to respond to violence questions over the phone. So that resistance, uh, hesitance to answer, uh, particularly IPV questions, we did experience finding that some people, the, the tone changes when you start talking about violence and they just wanted to quickly move to the next question and say, oh, nothing, uh, nothing bad happened. Some women uh, would rather talk about other people's experiences of IPV rather than their personal experience. Even when we asked them about their children, violence questions related to children, they just wanted to, add, to either speak about a friend who has shared their experience um, or a neighbor rather than talking about themselves. Amongst men, we found that they would rather talk about tension um, rather than violence. They would say that, yes, we've had some tensions with my spouse during this time. However, nothing bad happened. Uh, they were really not forthcoming in talking about um, violence questions. So what, what did we learn from this? What are we saying uh, based on this experience? We learned that it is important to deepen our knowledge in, uh, in conducting remote um, data, using remote data collection methods, particularly when you're asking questions around violence against women and violence against children during pandemics, particularly making sure that we create conditions that will enable our participants uh, to, to speak, because really, we really struggle to find good data around violence um, in our study. So we're currently analyzing our research. Uh, we are completing component two of the study. Uh, we'll analyze and then we'll publish our findings. Uh, so you do check the SAMRC uh, webpage where you will see um, everything uh, once the data is ready. Thank you so much.